What's up everybody? In this video, I wanna to talk to you about the importance and the power of making a series of ideally daily, small move, incremental improvements in your production and mixing skills and workflow. I think it's really easy to get distracted by searching for these kind of game changer, massive level up techniques or moments. You know, for example, if you've never used clipping in your mixing workflow and you learn about clipping and implement it really well, that's probably a 10% level up, you know, that's huge. Uh, or maybe you've never used structured busing before and then all of a sudden you start to use a submixing structure and bam, you're, you're getting a big noticeable uptick in results. That's great. And those things do come along, but they're kind of like these happy accidents or sometimes like lottery winning moments where, you know, they're windfalls and we'll take them when we get them. But you need something that you can rely on as a bread and butter day in, day out process of incremental improvement. And really, I think the big thing that stands out from top notch, incredible world leading engineers and producers and artists and people that are kind of average mediocre is this focus on how can I make the next small move? How can I make the next 1% improvement that gets me to level up? So I want to weave in a story here. There's a book that I really love that I've read a few times now, and it's called Atomic Habits. It's by James Clear. I know a lot of you will have either heard of it or read it. Please do. It's an amazing book. And there's a story from that book about the British cycling team. And they were kind of coming off the back of this long stint, and I mean like a hundred years long, of basically face planting. Like they hadn't won almost anything. It was one of the longest losing streaks of no noticeable distinguishing achievements in a sports history. And in 2003, they hired this new coach named Dave Brailsford, and he brought with him this philosophy called the aggregation of marginal gains. And what he thought was that if you summed up a whole bunch of 1% improvements, that when you added it all together, you would get a dramatic improvement that could hopefully propel this team into a winning streak. Well, for sure it did. Five years later, they won a huge proportion of the gold medals at the Beijing Olympics. And then several years after that, they won a huge proportion of the gold medals in the London Olympics. And then they had riders go on to win the Tour de France in back-to-back -back years, which they had never had anyone win the Tour de France in 110 years previous. So how did he do it? And how can we apply that to what you do with music and mixing music? So they would go on an absolute hunt, a ruthless hunt for these things that I think a lot of other people overlooked. They would do things like assign sleep specialists to the riders and figure out what each individual rider's preference was for pillows and mattresses that led to the best sleep because recovery matters. They had the riders wear electrically heated training shorts that would keep their muscles in their legs at the optimal temperature when they were training or performing. They figured out that they rubbed alcohol on the tires of the bikes that it gave them more grip and it just went on and on and on. And, and it was quite exhaustive, this process. They got really imaginary and they were even getting down to things like figuring out how to re remove floating dust from the inside of the transport vans that they carried the bikes in so that dust wouldn't accumulate on the components like the chains and the derailers and stuff like that. That's the aggregation of marginal gains and the results speak for themselves. You look at that, that's an absolutely game-changing level up over time, but it wasn't one or even 10 things. It might not have even been a hundred things, but it was a daily and ruthless commitment, a full commitment, a full send into the aggregation of marginal gains. So yeah, I think that this is something that I've tried to apply in my world, and I'm always looking for ways to level up even a little bit each day that I'm working. And so I'd like to share some of the things that I've done and I'd like to ask you for ideas because I'm sure there's a lot that I can learn from you too. You know, that's the beautiful power of community in this channel. You know, we've we've got well over 100,000 people on this channel now. And I know that a lot of you will have figured out things that I haven't figured out yet. So I'd like to have this be an open forum to uh, maybe all learn and level up together. But I'll start and just share some of the things that I think are low hanging fruit 
some of the areas I've looked. Obviously, one of those things is doing whatever you can to optimize your acoustic environment, because if you can hear 1% better, you can mix 1% better, right? Now, um, I know you guys can probably say easy for you to say you're sitting in this dream studio, but you know, I'm 46 years old and I only just had this built in the last year. So I've worked in a lot of other studios that were nowhere near like this room. And I just did things like acoustic testing, put up acoustic panels and then was optimizing. You know, I didn't have a ceiling cloud at first and then eventually I put a ceiling cloud up and then eventually I figured out a bit more about how to trap low frequencies and smooth out the frequency response in the room. Then I, on top of that, once I optimized the room, I added a layer of some uh, room optimization EQ in Sonarworks, you know? And that's equipment, you know, you're always gonna be wanting to level up your equipment and invest into equipment whenever you can. But what about stuff inside the box, inside your process? 1% improvements might be things that other people overlook, I said, right? So it might be the difference between using a dynamic EQ on something versus a static EQ. That's a huge change to my workflow over the last three or four years is primarily using dynamic EQ or using EQ whenever I do a boost, doing an attenuation somewhere else, basically viewing EQ through the lens of shifting energy versus just cutting something or boosting something in isolation. A lot of times I've, I've found that it can be useful to shift the energy by attenuating one frequency while moving that energy up and boosting another frequency. It doesn't always work like that, but it's a neat mindset shift that's happened. It could be the difference between using one limiter or using another limiter, or it could be the order that you put your effects into. You know, I used to think, for example, that you didn't or shouldn't limit vocals. And then I learned that actually limiting vocals is one of the best things you can possibly do. And in fact, putting the limiter before your compressors on the vocal is a best practice because it helps to even out spurious peaks that was then causing the compressors to create artifacts. You know, I can draw on so many of these things. Uh, another one, using saturation. I began using the black box analog design HG2MS saturator. You've seen it in some of my recent videos and it's uh, able to work in mid side mode. And I was primarily using stereo saturators that had no ability to discriminate between saturation on the mid signal and on the side signal. And as a result, it was making all of these delicate uh, moves that I'd done in the mix to make it sound deep in 3D and it was undoing some of that because that's what saturation does. It kind of takes everything and squeezes it and makes it feel all up front, all one dimensional. And you never want to do that on a full mix for sure. And you oftentimes don't want to do that on a full bus either. But accessing mid side saturation, and this was a technique I learned from Luca Pratalesi, um, allows you to be a bit more heavy handed in the mid, and then you can leave the sides alone a little bit. And so you get all the reverb tails and the drum bodies and the decays of instruments that uh, are less saturated and you have, you preserve your sense of depth. Okay. We're starting to, to really realize what these things are, right? Another big one is ear fatigue and monitoring levels. That's, uh, definitely more than a 1% for me, is one thing is uh, I used to monitor at very high levels. I used to get really into the music, you know, I'd have a coffee and I'd, I'd turn the volume up because I was like, ah, I was feeling it. You know, I felt like the vibe when you're at a festival or a club. Well, big mistake. Once I learned about equal loudness contours and I understood the psychoacoustic perception of different frequencies, I understood that uh, the human ear perceives bass in a very different way than it perceives other frequencies. And when the volume is very low, you have a tendency to overmix the bass because it's down close to the hearing threshold. You, you need at low volumes, especially you need a lot of bass compared to other frequencies to be able to hear it. So if you monitor really, really low, really quiet, you're going to overmix your bass. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, all of those curves in the base end of the equal loudness contours compress as you get uh, further up in terms of sound pressure level. And then all of a sudden, a very small increase in the amount of bass makes it sound way louder. So when you're monitoring too loud, you end up under mixing your bass and everything in your song, the whole low end is anemic. It was a huge mistake I was making. Plus, on top of that, compounding that error is when you mix really loud, you fatigue your ears really quickly. So two hacks about that that I learned. 
was there is a sweet spot to be able to mix. And I measure that now with a SPL meter. And for me in my room with my, the way I calibrate my monitors, it's somewhere around 75 to 80 dB SPL C weighted. So that's a sweet spot where I can mix for a long, long, long time. And I perceive the bass as uh, much more balanced with the other frequencies in my mix. And, and I don't make errors like that. The other thing in terms of ear fatigue is the high frequencies are gonna fatigue your ears much more quickly. So one of the things that Bob Katz, uh, mastering engineer and author, right, uh, teaches is the system of incrementally rolling off your high end. And this is for engineers like me who might be working in the studio for a long, long, long time. And see, so he says to, in your monitoring using an EQ, a tilt to start from 1K and then terminate at 20K and you're seven dB down by 20K, right? It sounds unnatural, it sounds weird. You have to learn it, right? You have to learn how to adapt to it. But what it allows you to do is to mix without fatiguing for eight, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Some of the engineers that I know that use this curve, they're able to mix for that long and be objective and they're, they're not fatigued, okay? You might not like it, but for engineers that are doing this professionally and pulling long hours, getting work done, it can work for them and that's that's a big a big improvement all right so i'm going to wrap it up there and just say aggregation of marginal gains awesome apply it to music apply it to your studio your equipment even things that you do you may find that you work better at certain times of day i'm a morning person i love waking up early you know having a bit of tea getting into the studio I am not an evening person. You know, by the time I have dinner, I'm done for the day. I'm, I'm not feeling creatively motivated. Learning my own rhythm was was really big. So I'd love to hear from you what you think and uh, what are some of the things that have worked really well for you. I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff that I can learn. I appreciate in advance you uh, being vulnerable and sharing and, and letting us know and contributing. Right on. Um, slap a thumbs up on this video if you liked it. Drop me a comment below, of course, uh, about all the things we talked about. Subscribe to the channel if you are not already. And uh, yeah, I hope you are feeling empowered with your music. And I will catch you very soon on the next video. Take care. <laughs>